Hey everybody, this is Isaiah, and welcome back to Magic System Monday. Alright, uh, so recently I actually watched an anime called Little Witch Academia. Now hold on a second, Isaiah, why do you keep on talking about anime? I don't know, I plead the fifth, just bear with me. There's a reason for this. Uh, there's a reason I'm bringing this up. There's uh, Little Witch Academia. Now, Little Witch Academia is actually, uh, at least an image, quite similar to something like Harry Potter. Where there's, oh, there's, you know... It's like wizardry. Well, not really wizardry. It's mainly just witches, which are female wizard people. And uh, they go off to this, you know, school, this old archaic school, to go learn how to use magic, and they use wands, and they have flying brooms, and this, that, and the third. Now, at, in a way, it's actually quite, like, like I said, it's quite similar in flavor and otherwise to something like Harry Potter. But there are a couple of key qualities here, and a couple of little mechanics that I think are really, really interesting that maybe are not the most unique, but are utilized in an interesting enough way to make it stand out compared to other similar things. It's not just a, uh, oh, a superpower academy where you, you know, you they, they learn how to use hone their magic and things like that. Or, you know, I mean, it is, but, uh, but in order to talk about those interesting mechanics, I'm going to have to give you a little bit of the background into Little Witch Academia and how its world magic system works. Uh... The magic system itself, in and of itself, is something that you can barely really get wrong. It's basically, there is magical energy, but unlike, say, Harry Potter, which, if you watched Fantastic Beasts, or if you read it, I'm not sure, I'm not sure which they say it in, it's been a long time, but, uh, they have an internal magic source if you're a wizard or, uh, or a witch. You actually have some kind of gland or something that produces magic, so it's really weird, it's some kind of physiology thing. In this sense, it's sort of more similar to the basic fantasy concept, which is there's magic in the universe. But this magic, uh, of course, while people do harness it the same way, use spells with the, the words and they wave their wand, abracadabra, this, that, and the third, uh, there's, actually an intern there's actually an inherent source of magic here. A uh, long time ago, in a galaxy far, far, no, I'm just kidding. But a long time ago, there was this giant magical tree called Yggdrasil. It was just this humongous tree on Earth that was apparently so large that it literally spread out, its branches spread out into the, into the, into space, and like, they held up the stars. So then we have this grand old tree thing, and this thing is the source of all magic. Magic is just something it produces for some reason. And while so, now some people actually have potential to harness this magic, this magic is everywhere, it spreads out all across the world or whatever, and uh, this was the golden age of witches, because the magic was so abundant, and it was all over the place, and it was everywhere. So it was sim it's similar to, say, something like in D&D, &D where you have uh, Mistra and you have the Weave, where it's just everywhere, and everyone has access to it, if they have the potential, or the skill, or they learn how to do it. Except that it's mainly her hereditary here. It's kind of confusing that they act like it's mainly hereditary, but apparently some people can just learn it anyway, and apparently some people have some magical prowess anyway. That, that's never mind that it's not important. But uh, that was the golden age because it was all over the place and the tree was flourishing and it was super abundant and everyone loved magic because it was super cool. But uh, since then, things have long since kind of tapered out. Uh, the tree is long since withered. In fact, the once mighty tree is actually nowhere to be seen. The tree has all but died for what we know. And all that we have left of it now is what they refer to as the ley line. Ley line are the kind of remnants, the few remnants scattered across the world of the roots of, the, of that divine tree. And uh, because the tree is gone effectively and only little shreds of it remain, uh, the magic that it produced naturally is also gone. Magic still exists. There's just so little of it that that uh, there's just so little of it that magic is not so common practice anymore. In fact, for some reason, uh, witches cannot utilize magic on their own anymore. Uh, they used to have their own propensity for absorbing and using that magic, but now they can't for some reason. So even the few uh, the little shreds of magic that these ley lines across the world put out. They don't even have the ability to use that themselves. Instead, they turn to what they refer to as the Philosopher's Stones. 
Uh, we only really see one in the series, but I think there's actually a little bit of proof that there's more than one. There are probably at least a few in the world. But they are effectively Wi-Fi signals. <laughs> that sounds silly. But uh, now these wi these uh, excuse me these Wi-Fi signals silly me. Uh, now these things basically they are capable of some kind of conversion process. So instead of us sucking up magic on our own and using it, they uh, they suck up magic from the ley lines in the in their vicinity, and then they output it almost like Wi-Fi. They output a signal of it. And anyone, any witch within range of that signal who's using, who has a wand or a broom or whatever kind of magical device that you have has access to whatever magic it puts out. And apparently it's very, very vast amounts of magic. They don't really seem to have any problem using it while in range. It seems to be effectively unlimited. Which is actually quite interesting. Because now this sets an interesting limitation. A lot of people do a similar thing in their work where they go, well, this is the anti-magic zone, and then they have those in D&D. They don't bring up D&D a lot, but it's just something that's so common enough that if I explain it in terms of D&D, uh, people will understand what I mean more like, more, they're more likely to understand what I mean. So, I, I'm probably going to keep doing that. Yeah, so, you know, okay, an anti-magic field, or you have an anti-magic device, or, or you have a counterspell, or a thing that negates magic. They have similar things to that here, but that's not really where things come from, where this limit comes into play. This limit comes into play in the sense that instead of having abundant sources of magic and then ways to negate that, uh, they just have limited sources of magic. Now you can only use magic for the most part. I'm going to get to the rest of that in a minute, but for the most part, you can only really use magic uh, in this area of effect of the Philosopher's Stone. Uh, there is actually one on campus, the academy that they go to, the little castle, has one on top of like a big tower thing that emanates outward. And, uh, it's kind of their bread and butter. I know I mentioned that uh, magic isn't so much common practice anymore, not only just because of that, because of technology. Uh, and technology can basically work anywhere. I don't know why I brought that up. Uh, but anyway, so now they can only really use it in this range, this area of effect. And that means that uh, your ability to use it in any given situation is quite limited, except you know to the homestead, so to speak, where you can totally practice magic there and make little spells and make little potions and things there. But if you're not in range of it, say if you're going out to the city, and they do this a lot actually in the series where they will go out to the city or something, and they don't really have access to the Philosopher's Stone there because it's out of range, and well, they can't really do anything. They can't really use magic that much. The next limitation that I want to talk about is really interesting. It refers to the wands. Not just in the sense of, oh, I can't use my magic without a wand. Uh, no, uh, they use wands similar to the way they do in Harry Potter here. But the key thing about it is that they have a crappy battery. Emphasis on crappy. <laughs> now, what's so big of a deal about crappy battery? All right. Wands hold their own magic, just very, very little, so that when you're on campus or using using in the area of the Philosopher's Stone and you're using magic, you know it's you know, it's your normal use of magic. But when you step out, you're not just completely without magic. You have this little bit of magic that their wands hold, and while they've never given a specific number of spells that it can do, I imagine some spells are more powerful than others. Generally speaking. Uh, from what I've seen, it seems to be about two spells worth. So basically, you leave campus where there's limited and uh, there's limited magic. You only have two spells, so to speak. That's like in D and D being like, well, I only have two spell slots. Instead of going, all magic is negated in this area, of, in this area, or instead of saying there is no magic at all except in these specific places, they say the magic is severely, and I mean severely limited. There are actually uh, episodes where. They will use magic off campus, but they really, you know, there's only so much they can do. They have to be extremely sparing with what magic and what spells they use. Uh, as a minor spoiler, there was one episode where they left campus uh, where they were looking for something, which required them to turn into animals. They had to, I'm not sure if that's transfiguration or, or uh, polymorphing or, look, I'm not a, I, I'm not super keen on my schools of magic or whatever, but uh, generally speaking, they shapeshifted into animals. And they took the first spell to shapeshift, 
And the funny thing about how it works in this world is uh, you need magic to change back too. It doesn't change back by being negated or something. Like if you run out of magic, it doesn't just change you back to normal. They have to use the spell again, meaning that they have to, and they say that they have to save their last spell, so to speak, uh, for when they need to change back. Otherwise, they'll be stuck. So it is a very strong limiting factor in terms of their magic economy, in a way, uh, when they're off of campus. So that so uh, it's a pretty simple stuff there. I mean, there are minor, there are little minor inconsistencies here and there where, uh, where some where at a couple of times in the series, uh, they will be out of range of the philosopher's stone or whatever, and then this like the, the magic just stops, and apparently and they will check the battery and they have no battery. It's, it's really weird. It's almost like the plot sometimes charges them and sometimes it doesn't, but mostly it does. Mostly they do have access to it. You, you get what I'm saying? Mostly they do have it, as opposed to the times where the plot decides that it just doesn't work or whatever. But anyway, I, I say all that to say, uh, just to give you guys some examples of how some people like to execute their limits. Uh, sometimes you go, oh, well, there's mana. I only have this much mana to cast my whatever. And there are some series like Harry Potter where you can just kind of do whatever you want, however often you want. And there are some things like Doctor Strange where it's kind of ambiguous. I know I heard in the comic books that there are different sources of energy that you have to actually draw from to use magic. But in the Doctor Strange we have in the movie, he kind of just seems to just, you know, do whatever you want. He didn't seem to, oh, I'm out of magic or I'm out of energy. Or maybe wherever they draw energy from is limitless. But either way, uh, well, it is limitless. And so, just giving you guys some examples on what kind of limits you can apply to them as opposed to just using the same ones or, you know, maybe you have your own ideas, but still, kind of to inspire you guys on all the different ways you can do it. Like I mentioned before, I want to throw as many options at you guys as possible. So instead of, you know, so in this case, uh, instead of having, say, anti-magic zones or a bunch of things that negate magic, just have magic in a very limited sense and then have magic outside of that area in an even more limited sense. But yeah, that's all I really had for today. Uh, it's, it was super simple. It was just something that I... I don't think I... It's really simple, but I don't think I really have ever seen anything do it that way. And like, in that... To that manner. Excuse me. Ugh. Even though it's really simple, I don't think I've ever seen a series or a show or a book or whatever do it exactly that way. Because you know, usually it's just that, you know, if you're out of zone, then you're just nothing. But still... Anyway, that's all I really had for today, and I thank you all for listening. Uh, until next time, this is Isaiah from Magic System Monday, and I'll see you later.